What do we mean by deliberately developmental spaces? Be the most effective human beings we can be to make a positive difference in the world. Aikido being a way to polish one's character. This is the meaning crisis. So welcome to our first kind of pilot dialogues around deliberate development and conscious collectives with myself, Rufus Pollock, uh, co-founder at Life Itself, and Carl Stayert of the Cultural Catalyst Network and also collaborator here at Life Itself. Thanks. Good to be here. Yeah. And we're going to, today we're going to talk a little bit about what do we mean by deliberately developed space? I guess the experiment the ECT experiment, I think we could start with that, the American Collective Transformation effort that got run in 2022. And then out of that, I think we want to come to our belt metaphor that Carl, Carl and I have talked about before. So I want to start, Carl, like maybe you could just tell me a bit about, very briefly about your interest in, we could say conscious collectives or deliberately developmental programs uh, or spaces, you know, yeah, what brought you to there? I mean, you've worked in this for like decades. What's, what's so interesting to you about it? What, what lights your passion about it? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Rufus. I mean, I would track back concretely my passion for deliberately developmental spaces to two experiences in particular. One is training in martial arts, specifically Aikido, a Japanese nonviolent martial art, for quite a few years, starting in my 20s. Um, and really seeing that as a space for not just physical training, but really also for whole person training. I would say, you know, we sometimes talked about Aikido being a way to polish one's character. And I really appreciate that about the martial arts is this intention to become more and more someone who moves through the world, not just physically, but also psycho-spiritually with a certain kind of integrity and presence. And so that has always inspired me greatly is this desire to develop myself in order to be able to be more of service in the world. And then another experience, which was living and working at the Findhorn Foundation, uh, which is, for those who don't know, an intentional community that's been around since the early 60s in Scotland. And which is really like the grandmother of the eco village movement in a lot of ways, and also has been long a place of what they call uh, personal and planetary transformation. And I had the opportunity to live there and work there and uh, to be the director of a program called the Finhorn Community Semester, which was a three month academic accredited semester program for young adults to live at Findhorn, get academic credit while doing four courses in ultimately about inner interpersonal and systemic transformation. So those are two sort of notable examples from my life of working in creating del deliberately developmental spaces and that I just found myself lit up by those experiences. I mean, they, what it excites me is this sense of being able to constantly be at my own learning edge and be contributing to something larger than myself. And to be doing that with other people where we are really at this edge of what are you passionate about in life? How can we help in a sense, like sharpen each other's swords in order to like be the most effective human beings we can be to make a positive difference in the world? To me, I don't, I don't know what else I'd rather do with my life than that. And my conclusion through my own experience has been that when we come together in what the Buddhists call Sangha, in a community of practice, when we have this kind of intensive in-person shared training, whether it's an eco-village like Findhorn or on a, in a dojo practicing Aikido, the, the potential for growth and development really accelerates a tremendous amount. That's, I think, why we have monasteries on the planet. And of course, it may not be for everybody. I do think that there are ways that we could modify even the monastery model so that actually people could choose different levels of intensity. But 
I think that having this life where we are belonging to something with other people, like we have a sense of deep belonging and inclusion in a community, and we're contributing to something larger than ourselves, I think that is what so many people are hungering for, what really would fulfill many people who feel unfulfilled. And I think about John Verveke's uh, recordings here, like Awakening to the Meaning Crisis. It's like, this is the meaning crisis, is this longing to belong to something larger than ourselves and to contribute meaningfully. And so that's that's what excites me. And that's what excites me about this idea of deliberately developmental spaces. So I, I hope that jumbled oh, share. That's great. No, I want to break down for listeners. I think I want to talk briefly, give us kind of what we mean by deliberately developmental spaces or the more kind of friendly term, maybe conscious collectives that we'll use. I I think Carl's already just done a great job. That's why I wanted uh, to share like that because you could think of, you know, an Aikido Zojo or or Fintorn, particularly the specific course, not just Fintorn maybe itself. So when we say, no, these are spaces that are developmental and by space we could mean it's a physical space it's a space where people actually come it could mean also a temporal space a program that lasts a certain period of time maybe in person potentially in line although that's something we could come to discussion about but it's about development and by development we mean inner development or transformation and consciousness growth whatever you term you want to use but this focus on on development and that it's deliberate it's not you know my, you know, I have a son and he's growing up, he's developing, there's child development as a whole psychological area and he'll do that. But often it's not very deliberate, like it would just happen naturally. And there's nothing, by the way, that's great too. We'll, we'll develop in lots of ways, but we're talking here about spaces, programs, or, you know, actual kind of physical spaces where people are engaged in this kind of deliberate, intentional, conscious, um, de- inner developmental work. And so that's when you, you know, I think also to bring out Carl for listeners, when you talked about the kind of um, training uh, or you, you know, you talked about Fintorn, I think what's kind of novel there is like in a classic university program, you do learn skills. Um, and we, you said, you know, develop ourselves or, you know, sharpen our swords. It's not getting better at math here, although that's important. And although, you know, other skills, you know, the skills we learn in these kind of courses may underpin our ability to then learn other, you know, classic skills. We're more talking about the inner, uh, capacities that allow us to engage more meaningfully and more powerfully in the world in a, in a richer way. And we could maybe come and, and, and talk about that, but you may, you mentioned Aikido, you know, psycho spiritually, as well as the, the bigger part of the training in a way is not how you, you use the, 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 the sword, but how you, your being evolves. So that's what we, and you know, you can find out more about deliberately done into space. If you're listening in by going to developmental spaces to org, which is website and an overview and stuff. I want to come to maybe a point that you were mentioning, which is how you know, traditionally the spaces we could imagine like this were like a martial arts dojo, maybe they were a monastery. One of, you know, though, you know, most people are not going to go to a monastery, maybe, you know, full time at least. So options are there. Maybe can you say a bit about maybe the EC2, pro, the, the Embellion Collective Transformation Program that that we, you, you led, and there was a, you know, a co-project of life itself and Excite Foundation. Can you say a bit more about that as an example of like the kind of trying to experiment with novel forms of these kind of programs? Yeah. So with ECT, with Embodying cool. Collective Transformation, we ran three months of program and that included at the beginning of each month, a week long intensive training and then followed by three weeks of residential community living. And so that happened three times in a row, so three months in a row. And some people came for, uh, actually some people came for all three months, some people came for a month, some people in some cases only came for a week or two, but there was a particular experiment with a somewhat flexible container to do this kind of transformational work together. and. Our intention was specifically, as you said, at developing certain inner and interpersonal capacities. Uh, We did also talk and explore a bit around capacities for systemic transformation, but a lot of the foundation, as we see it, is really about helping people develop some of these inner skills like presence, self-connection, self-empathy, 
self-awareness in a whole variety of ways, self-regulation, emotional regulation, as well as interpersonal skills like collaborative decision-making, conflict resolution, giving and receiving feedback, empathic listening. These skills all, both the inner and the interpersonal, are, for example, seen in something like the IDGs, the Inner Development Goals, which are, are gaining some more uh, attention in the world recently as a way to, how do we concretely develop the capacities that are needed for the Sustainable Development Goals, which the United Nations has articulated? So what are the capacities that we as human beings need at this time in history in particular to be effective citizens, to be people who can make a positive difference in the world. And these inner and interpersonal skills are ones that we see as particularly useful to that kind of development. So that's what we focused on in the ECT program was giving people some really practical, repetitive practice in these certain skills and then living together for then months at a time in some cases to actually do this in practice, like to have the rubber hit the road where we're not just learning about empathy or learning to self-connect or self-regulate or make decisions together or na navigate conflict, but we're actually living alongside people where we're going to have a conflict and we're going to need to slow down and practice listening to each other. We're going to need to sit in a group and make a complex decision about how to handle COVID protocols when people are really emotionally charged. And we need to really slow down and listen to everybody and make ideally a wiser decision based on hearing everybody's perspective and collaborating together. So that's, that's a bit more about what we were doing with ECT. Um, yeah. So to, to explain, just to say, is to, to back up, Okay, so we're interested in these kind of spaces that foster these capacities, that these deliberately developed spaces are precise to kind of foster these capacities, whether it's empathy, collective decision-making, conflict resolution, uh, self-connection, self-regulation. These capacities we need, it, you know, we're not going to go off, but like to, to say, you know, in the face of what's going on in the world today and the great challenges we have, et cetera. And again, you can check out developmentalspace.org for more on that. What I want to get at is the point of running this three month experiment was to look at novel ways of creating these space. So it's, it's different, to, you know, to emphasize maybe for our, like to reflect what we were trying to do and to share, you know, this maybe is that at one level, you've got like the monastery where you're there, you know, for years or some other very like, I don't know, intensive in a development program, which is obviously kind of limited in who can participate, you know, there's a mon monastery kind of getting maybe for the rest of your life or a nun or certainly for, you know, years or something like that. And on the other end, you've got things where, you know, you go for a week retreat or you, or even, you know, you go to therapy every week for an hour. And what we were looking at is that something maybe that was in between those places. On the one hand, when you, you know, the challenge of the kind of retreat or the therapy program, it, while it does obviously have an impact, it clearly does, the ability for kind of create sustained sustained ontological transformation or sustained inner development is often quite limited. You know, we all have that experience, maybe many people have that experience, you know, you go, you go on the retreat, you know, it's amazing. You kind of vow to come back and meditate every day for an hour, you know, 5 a.m. And when, like within two weeks, you're not meditating, you know, or you're going to do yoga every day or whatever. It's sometimes very difficult. And as you know, that thing that, that, tra that change from what we call state to trait in psychology when something goes from just being a state you've experienced to ongoing kind of feature of your behavior takes kind of sustained practice. And so we were experimenting here with something in, both on a time scale and with a structure. And at the, you know, I think the other poll that we maybe want to point out is passing, you know, this intentional community, which I think is famously described as, you know, the longest, most valuable and most expensive personal development course you'll ever take, you know, the challenge that we've seen in like just, we've done quite a lot of just co-living, people just coming together to live together, whether for a month, three months or a year. Carl, you've been, you've helped run, you've, you've helped found, you've participated in many of those. And we at Life of Self have run those. They, there is a lot of development going on, but what we also saw was lacking that went on in ECT was like a common base. So there was this combination in the embodying collective transformation 
experiment that we ran of this week training, plus then you practice in kind of real life, in conscious community, in co-living. And that combination seemed quite interesting to us, that there, that there would be a set of practices that everyone had done, that everyone had learned, and that then it would get to practice. So this kind of combination seemed relatively, or this explicit combination seemed relatively unusual. And I'd like to ask you, Carl, briefly now to say a bit more about what were these core practices that, you know, out of your experience and all your work in many, many other traditions, but you brought together and designed with your collaborators to go into that practice, kind of the, the kind of practice week, the, the training week at the beginning. Can you say a bit more about what were the set of practices and the ecology of practices and why you put them together in the way you, you did? First, I just want to say that this experience has been tremendously valuable in terms of also my own self-awareness about where are some of the gaps in my own embodiment. So before I say anything more, I just really want to make that caveat is that, wow, it's, it's humbling and really powerful to be in an intentional transformational space with people and to see, oh, wow, here's where the limits to my capacity are. And so before I say anything more, I just want to acknowledge that, that challenge. So the practices that we were exploring together, many of them were founded in two traditions in particular, and I'll name them. One is internal family systems, or also known as internal family systems therapy or IFS, and nonviolent communication. Now, the reason why these two modalities were particularly drawn on as source material is because their essence, I think, has a lot of broad application to this inner and interpersonal development. So nonviolent communication, while certainly it can be applied in more uh, narrow ways, its essence is really about helping people get aware of their own emotional state and to identify what are their basic needs in a situation. Um, Internal Family Systems, or IFS, is helping people recognize that we have a multiplicity of parts to our personality. We have, in a sense, sub-personalities. So in practical terms, this looks like people being able to pause when, particularly, let's say, when we're triggered or when we're upset in a situation, when, we, when we're getting reactive, but even just in any situation, that we can pause and notice what's happening inside, that I can notice, gosh, what am I feeling right now? And even though that may seem like the most commonplace thing, in many cases, we're actually living or thinking at a pace where we're actually disconnected from maybe inner anxiety or sadness or frustration that might be sort of looming under the surface. And so these practices looked like meditating, doing interpersonal practices where we slow down to notice, wow, what is actually the subtext of what's happening inside of me in our interaction? Am I actually feeling a little bit anxious right now as I'm talking with you? And am I looking for some kind of validation? Am I looking for some sense of desire to be recognized for my competence in a particular situation? These things which kind of just go under the surface in a lot of interactions are actually tremendously valuable to be more aware of, not to be super self-conscious all the time, but simply to be aware that, oh, actually my ulterior motive in a situation is to be liked or to be recognized as competent. And so we bring these things from the subconscious or the unconscious more into open awareness through various practices that we had explored together. But while that can seem a bit abstract, perhaps, and not so practical, there are also these very, very practical applications that I mentioned. So, for example, how do we make a decision together when we're a community? How are we making a decision about, I mentioned COVID protocols, but also it could be how the we're going schedule. to... Yeah, the exactly. food schedule. What we're going to are... eat. Will it be vegan or not vegan or something? Exactly. Yeah. So these very kind of practical decisions and in those cases, too, anybody who's lived in community realizes that the most mundane decisions about the dishes or about what we're going to eat or you name it, 
can often actually become quite contentious and can lead to conflict. And that conflict is often because these unacknowledged deeper layers of motivation or needs aren't being brought to the surface. And so by bringing these sort of underlying feelings and needs to the surface, we actually make better decisions together. We, we navigate conflict better together and we create a safer space. And, and by safer space, there's been more and more recognition that transformational spaces are really served by creating an emotional safety in the environment, a place where people have a sense that, oh, wow, like all of me is welcome and that I can be vulnerable and that's a safe thing to have happen in community. And so these practices that we did together were really about creating that kind of safe space. And within it, what we experienced is so many people recounted, wow, I've never felt so safe in my life. And not only does that, is that enjoyable, but it helps me learn more quickly. It helps me get to know other people in a way that builds deeper bonds and sense of intimacy. And through that, people are more able to discover, okay, this is what I'm passionate about in my life. And these are the ways that I can more effectively create communities with other people. So these are some of the examples of, of the practices that we did together. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for sharing. And I think we're going to kind of wrap up today's episode in a moment, but I want to just reflect also for people, whether you've lived in community or you haven't, you know, as a human being, you will live in kind of, you could say a collective, it might be your family, it might be your work colleagues. Um, and we all know, probably anyone who's been in a family that conflict arises and, and, and tragically conflict can persist. Um, to, you know, for, for sometimes for, for years, uh, or decades. And, you know, we see that in the world today. I mean, you know, we could point to com ongoing conflicts in Israel and, and Palestine and in, in, in Russia and the Ukraine and many other places. And the, I think part of the thing at the end, I don't want to make it true, but like conflicts over doing the dishes, they can seem like a very trivial matter, but if you can kind of break the capacities to deal with that, um. You know, or like a debate over vegan food actually goes to very deep issues for some people. Like, you know, some other, you're going to participate in the killing of animals or, you know, you're going to tell me what to do about what I want to eat that's good for my health. You know, these, if we can powerfully navigate those things and provide the kind of, the, the skills and capacities in here, not the skills like in mass, but the inner skills to be able to navigate and resolve those in a constructive and powerful and, and satisfying and whole way for people. That's kind of builds the basis for this much broader area that we can see in our, in our world. And so I think there's also this real connection, you know, we didn't get to mention between where the personal, the personal, interpersonal, and then the systemic really shows up in this kind of ladder of connection and, and of connect and contribution. So I just want to say, thank you, Carl. This is the first, uh, one of these little pilot episodes we're doing, and I look forward to doing more with you and uh, thank you so much. Thanks Rufus. Yeah. Pleasure.